Thanks for taking the time to tune in and listen today. And I pray that God would encourage you today that through hearing the word, your faith will grow, that you'll be empowered, you'll be strengthened, as well as challenged. Because I know the plans that God has for you and to live them out to their fullest. The plans for a good future, bright future, Scripture says. And I just hope and pray today that through this message, you'll hear God speak to you and give you a better today and a lot more better tomorrows. Thank you for tuning in. Good morning. morning. We're thrilled to be with you today to share some of the exciting things that God is doing to build His church on the North Andean field of South America. And as Edgar mentioned, that's Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. And it's been our privilege and and a blessing to us to serve God in the Church of the Nazarene over these past years. And it's it's been tremendous what God has done to build His church. At times we've just felt like we're just barely holding on as He's building His church and uh, we're trying to to do what we can to help. But uh, in the time we've been serving, the church, when we first arrived there, had a total of uh, 30 churches in the three countries. And today we have over 400. We had, uh, when we arrived there, there were four districts. There were four districts, and today there are, over seven, there are 17 districts. And there were 2,000 total members in the three countries, and today we have over 59,000. So you can see that God has just been doing something tremendous. In fact, the largest uh, local church of the Nazarene in the world is in Cali, Colombia. And I believe your pastor has visited there Uh, this morning. They'll have over 17,000 people, not just this morning, but through the day because they have six worship services. And uh, God is just blessing his work. In the country of Ecuador, we have 12 specific Indian groups. And at one point in our ministry, the Lord gave us the opportunity to open the work of the church among the Otavalo Indians. And this is a group of Indians that are known worldwide for their weavings. They make blankets and wall hangings and sweaters and just anything you can think of that has been woven. This morning we have a special treat. We have an Indian lady by the name of Maria and she's going to come in and share with you for a few minutes about her people. Maria, are you around here somewhere? I th- you speak a Spanish? You speak a Quechua. Oh, well, I only speak just a little bit of English, but I will try to speak to you in English this morning. But my name is Maria, and I bring you greetings from the Otavalo Indians in Ecuador. You know, I like your country. You have everything nice. But you know what I especially like that place is a big art you call a Mecca, Mecca Donalds? Oh, those big Macs, they're so very good. And as I look around, I think I've seen some of you people in my country. Ah, but I never know. All you white people, you all look alike. (laughs) You know, the Otavalo Indians, they're the most industrious Indians in Ecuador. And they're also the richest of the Indians. And you know how we tell how rich we are? By how many beads we wear. But as you see, I don't have any many beads. And I'm very poor in my country. And now we ladies, we work us so very hard, and we carry heavy loads on our back. And you see, I'm only four feet tall. Oh, but when I get old, I've been way over, and I'll walk like this. Can you see me? I'll walk like this, just like all the other old ladies do in my village when we get old. And you know, when I work up in the garden in the mountains, it is so steep that I have to anchor myself with a rope to the mountain to keep from falling off the mountain. And ah, sometimes my husband, Eduardo, helps me, but not very often. Ah, my Eduardo. It breaks my heart. When Friday night come, him take his pay, and I do not see him all weekend. And when him come home, I'm so drunk, him not know what him doing. Or many times the husbands, they're killed along the roadside. Or many times I take my children with me, and I have to go out and I have to look for my Eduardo. And I drag him home by his ear, and then on a Monday morning, him go back to work again. But you know my Eduardo, when him gets sober and him gets all dressed up, him very good looking. Him have a very beautiful smile with one tooth up here and one tooth down there. 
and he put on him white pants and him white shoes like mine and him beautiful poncho and he's like that. And you know, the Otavalo Indian men, they do not cut their hair. They wear one little single braid in the back. And you know what I was thinking this morning, wouldn't your pastor look so very handsome with one little single braid in the back like my Eduardo? I think your people want you to try that, Pastor. I think he want to try too. And it'd be very nice with my hair, I think. But you know, I keep praying for my Eduardo to find Jesus. Because I'll never forget how it was for myself before missionaries come to my village and told me how Jesus could come in my heart. I, I thought it was a good person, but I had much sin in my life. But you know, my Eduardo, when him finally became a Christian, him beat me. And I still have scars on my back this day when he beat me. But you know, him could not take my Jesus away from me. And my six children, they know Jesus today. You know, my children and I, we love to have all of you people come visit me in my country. Ah, but you come, you see that we live in an adobe hut house made of mud brick. Oh, but we are very clean people, believe me. I sweep my dirt floor every single day. And you know, I'd love to give you something good to eat for my garden. Maybe some bell corn to eat or maybe some potatoes. But you know, I love to give you special treat. We always give missionaries when they come to my village is guinea pig. Oh, oh, it's very good. No, get sick. It's very good. And it's so delicious. It's served with the head and the feet and the toenails. And it smiles at as you eat it. <laughs> oh, I think the lady back there was getting sick. I really do. And you know, another special treat, we love to give work and witness people. They come to my country, you have to come to my country. It is called a blood sausage. Oh, it's so many good. When you bite into it, it just squirts into your mouth. And now the kids up front here are getting sick, I think. And you know, we have to walk everywhere we go. I don't know if you sell my shoes. They're falling off, matter of fact. They're not very comfortable. I get blisters on the bottom of my feet. But you know, I remember the work and witness people. They come to my country, and I see some right now called tennis shoe. That's what you call them? Yeah, I need, somebody want to trade with me? Oh, I like boots too. Boots, nice. Boot. I call boot? Well, I'd like to ask the pastor to come up here. Don't you think him look? Very handsome with one little single braid in the back. Let's clap for that, people. <laughs> Pastor, whoop, I got upside down. Whoop. I, I, my people make this for your people. Oh, thank you. You want a picture? <laughs> Only one dollar for picture. <laughs> Two dollar inflation problem. Well, I think the missionary hymn has to speak. Gracias, Pastor. Hasta luego. Come visit me in my country. Hasta luego. Ciao. Praise the Lord, all nations. Praise him, all peoples. His love for us is strong. His faithfulness is eternal. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> As uh, we were getting ready to come back to the States, somebody said, I think what you should share when you go back is what you have learned during your, min your years of ministry serving as missionaries. And so this morning, I'd just like to share with you very quickly three thoughts of what God has taught us as we have uh, served him on the mission field. And the first thing is that if God calls us, he gives us promises and he goes with us to help us along the way. Now, I was born into a Nazarene parsonage in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. My parents were planting a brand new church of the Nazarene. And when I was three years old, they were appointed as missionaries to Haiti, and they moved down there. Since I didn't have anything else to do, I moved along with them. When I was eight years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. When I was 14 years old, I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. And I had some thoughts of my own. One of my thoughts was that I had worked with my father uh, building churches since the age of seven and I knew how to, I was a block mason, I could do carpentry, I could weld trusses and for new churches and so forth. And I thought maybe when I grow up, I'll become a builder and I will build great big buildings and I'll make a lot of money. Now I had a second thought. Somebody had given me a camera and I love to take pictures 
And some folk from the United States had sent down the magazine National Geographic. And I loved to look at the pictures and read the articles from around the world. And I thought, maybe when I'll grow up, I'll become a professional photographer for the National Geographic magazine. And I'll travel across the world and I'll take pictures and I'll make a lot of money. My third thought was that my father, my grandfather Rich, had been a baseball player for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I thought I was a pretty good ball player. And I thought maybe when I grow up, I'll become a professional baseball player like my grandfather, and I'll become famous, and I'll make lots of money. Now, as I was thinking like this, a question came to me, and the question was, what would be the most important thing you could do with your life? Wow. I don't know if you've ever thought about a question like that. What would be the most important thing you could do with your life? Now, since I had already accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, the way I answered that to myself was to help others to come to know and love Jesus Christ just as I knew and loved Him. And another question came to me. Well, how could you best accomplish that? And the way I answered it was to spend my life in full-time Christian ministry helping others to come to know and love Jesus Christ as I did. And I took that as a call to preach. Now, one year later, my parents came back to the States for a year of furlough, and I became part of a youth group in the church we were attending as Dad was traveling around speaking. And in that youth group, they uh, taught us how to hold a vacation Bible school, and they called us an impact team, and they sent us down to Brownsville, Texas, on the border with Mexico to hold vacation Bible school. Now, while I was down there, I became very frustrated during that week because I could speak French, which was the official language of Haiti. I could speak Creole, which is the language of the heart of the Haitians. I could speak some English, and yet all of these children spoke Spanish, and I could not say anything to them, and they could not understand me. And so I was frustrated, and during that week, God kind of led me to believe that my ministry would be in a cross-cultural setting. And so I took that as a call to missions. Now, I had to finish high school and go to college, went to Mid-America Nazarene University, and then uh, married my wife, and we took a church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, pastored for three years, and then the Church of the Nazarene appointed us as missionaries to Ecuador. Now, the very next day after we were appointed as missionaries, I thought, I'll do my devotions in a way that I had never done before. And I took my Bible, and I opened it up, and with my eyes closed, I stuck my finger down, and I thought maybe God would speak to me and give me a message about our new ministry as missionaries. Now, I thought, I'm not just going to read one verse, but I'll read the whole chapter where I stick my finger. And I opened it to 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, <clears throat> when I got to verse 8, God began to speak to my heart. And this is what it says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Now, when I had read that far, I thought, now I know why I've never stuck my finger down, because if that's God's message to us, that sounds pretty rough. What are we going to have to face out there in the future? But I didn't, I didn't end reading right there, but I continued to read, and it says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. <clears throat> now, when we arrived in Ecuador, <clears throat> uh, my wife was pregnant with our second child, and when Stephanie was born, Carolyn's health began to go downhill. She got weaker and weaker until we took her to various doctors. They couldn't figure out what was wrong, and after about a month, she was admitted to the hospital, and over the course of a week, four specialists tried to find out what was wrong with her. At the end of that week, they hadn't figured it out, and Carolyn was so weak that she couldn't raise her arms from the bed. She didn't recognize anybody. Uh, 
her name had gone out on the Nazarene hotline for prayer, and Nazarenes across the United States were praying for her at that time. She had gotten so weak, I don't know if she had another day to live, when an endocrinologist discovered the problem, gave her the proper medication, and she began to respond immediately. Now, what had happened in the pregnancy was that Carolyn's thyroid gland had attacked her adrenal gland and had destroyed it. So she was no longer producing adrenaline. While she had the baby inside of her, the baby was providing a backup system through the umbilical cord. But once Stephanie was born, Carolyn no longer had the backup system, and she was getting weaker and weaker and would have died if they had not found the problem. Our thoughts went back to this passage of Scripture about being under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. And yet all of this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now about six months later, <clears throat> I was riding my Yamaha 400 Enduro motorcycle at 60 miles an hour down the only four-lane highway in the, in the city of Quito, Ecuador. A car pulled up on the side and I began to slow down as I watched him. He looked the other way, looked right back at me, and he came to a complete halt. I assumed that he had seen me and began to pour the gas back on the motorcycle, and boom, out he popped. I saw that I, wasn't go I hit the brakes and hit the horn, saw I wasn't going to be able to stop in time, and so I put it into a skid, trying to stop the motorcycle more quickly, and I hit him in the front end, flipped over the car, and landed in the opposing lanes of traffic. Nobody was coming at that point, and that was why he was pulling out. I went to try to get up, and my legs didn't work, and I looked down, and the bone was sticking through, my, through the jeans in my right leg. And I thought, I must have broken my leg. Now, now what I have not understood here is why here in the United States you laugh about a broken leg. I mean... <laughs> Uh, my first thought was, I wonder if they can fix this in an hour's time so I can make my appointment to go into the jungle with my boss, Dr. Louis Bussell, and the Global Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Director who was there visiting. Well, little did I know, but bone marrow got into the bloodstream and it went to the heart and the lungs and the brain and created a complication called a fat embolism. The doctor had only seen this uh, one time before in his 25 years of being a surgeon. My name went out on the Nazarene hotline for prayer and people across the United States began to pray, excuse me, pray for me. Now, <clears throat> I spent one week in intensive care uh, in a coma and then I began to recover from that. I spent the whole first month in the hospital with both of my legs in traction because they were both shattered below the knees. And then they operated on me. And uh, today I have two steel plates and 13 screws in my legs. And some people have accused me of having one loose one up here somewhere. <laughs> but once again, our thoughts went back to this passage of Scripture about being under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. And yet all of this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. <clears throat> While I was still in bed with both of my legs and cast from above the knee to the tip of the toes, our son Brian, who was just three years old, was bitten by a rabid cat. Now, Carolyn had to go around and try to find where the medicine was located, and uh, she was told, well, if you use the anti-rabies vaccine that they make here in Ecuador, if he doesn't have rabies from the cat bite, he's liable to get it from the vaccine. Well, that didn't sound very encouraging. And so she went to the U.S. Embassy, and they had a place where we could have it call and have it air shipped in from Miami, Florida, and we did that. Carolyn is a nurse, and so she took Brian through the series of shots against rabies, and he's fine today. But once again, our thoughts went back to that passage of Scripture about being under great pressure. And yet all of this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
After I was back up on crutches, we went to a, a local Nazarene church close to where we lived on a midweek service. And our daughter Stephanie, who was not a year old yet, fell, out of the, fell off the bench and hit her head on the concrete floor and she quit breathing. Carolyn, as a nurse, began to do CPR on her and was able to bring her back. And Stephanie is fine today. But once again, our thoughts went back to that passage of Scripture about being under great pressure. And yet all of this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, what I have just shared with you, all of these occurrences all happened in our first year and a half on the mission field. And we had national pastors and leaders coming up to us and other missionary staff saying, why don't you just go back to the United States of America? If all of this happened in the first year and a half, what do you have to expect for the future? But you see, what we learned is if God calls you, he gives you promises and he goes with you and he helps you along the way. Praise his name. A second thing that we have learned <clears throat> is that we serve an all-powerful God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or even imagine. Now we have seen that all-powerful God work in our lives and we've seen him work in the lives of others who are around us. In the city, city of Medellin, Colombia, <clears throat> we have a pastor there and maybe that Medellin, Colombia rings a bell with some people. That's where the famous Medellin drug cartel used to be with Pablo Escobar. And I know here in the United States there have been several movies and even television series that have come out on the life of Pablo Escobar. Well, in that city, we had a pastor who wanted to be involved in any kind of evangelistic strategy, and he found out about the Jesus film and decided he wanted to be involved with that. Now, there was a problem in his case because several delinquent and violent gangs in the city of Medellin had already threatened his life and told him, we do not want to see you out in any kind of outdoor evangelism. Well, that's exactly how we do the Jesus film. We, we do it in a, on a ball field, in a public park, or right out in the street. And this pastor still wanted to be involved in it. So we were able to train him in a group of people in his church, and we got them the equipment, and they set the date. And the pastor went out, and, and he arrived with all of the equipment, and his, his, his group from the church had not arrived yet to help him set up. So he thought, I'll begin to... Un uh, unpack things and get it ready and so he was stooped over unpacking the bags and pulling out the equipment when he became aware that one of those delinquent and violent gangs that had threatened his life was approaching and he didn't know what to do his first thought was I've got all of this expensive equipment it belongs to the church of the Nazarene I've got to get it to safety but what you have to understand is we're talking about five fairly large packing cases and one person could not pick it all up at one time, let alone run with it. And so as he's trying to figure out what he's going to do, he waits too long and he's completely surrounded by that gang of delinquents that had threatened his life. And he didn't know what to say to them. But as he stood to his feet, <clears throat> it was like God gave him the right words to say. And he looked around at those guys and he said, oh, hi, how y'all doing this afternoon? He said, well, you know, he didn't really say, hi, how y'all doing? But the equivalent in Spanish. He said, you know, we're going to show the Jesus film here tonight, right in this place. And my team from the church has not arrived yet to help me set up the equipment. Would you guys be willing to help me set it up? Well, they were shocked by that. That had not been their intention as they approached this gang who had threatened their life, threatened his life. And so they kind of hem-hawed around and stuttered a little bit. And finally, the leader of the gang said, well, I, I guess we can help you. So the pastor taught them how to set up the equipment, how to set up the big screen and the sound system. And when it was all set up, the team from the church had not arrived yet. Now, I kind of think maybe they had arrived and they saw what was going on over there and they thought, we're just going to let the pastor handle this one. But the pastor looked at those guys and he said, my team is not here yet. Would you guys be willing to help me pass out invitations in the community? 
Well, once again, they were, were shocked by that. And they said, well, we, we helped you set up the equipment. We might as well help you pass out the invitations. So I can only imagine it that afternoon as this violent group of delinquents went through that community. And everybody knew exactly who they were and what they did. And we print out these little paper invitations to the Jesus film. Gracias, Sarita. Dios le bendiga. Excuse me. It must be my age. I think people are saying you're <clears throat> starting to have problems speaking and we need to get you some water because that has happened over and over. <laughs> but uh, so we had these little invitations uh, and so this gang of delinquents went from door to door through that community and they would go up to somebody's house and they would say, the Church of the Nazarene would like to invite you to come at 7 o'clock this evening to watch the film Jesus of Nazareth filmed on location in Israel with, in full color with all Jewish actors. We would like you to be there at 7 o'clock sharp or else. <laughs> Now, I really don't know that they said or else, but I do know <clears throat> there was a great crowd there that evening because I monitored the, the statistics from the Jesus film showings. And so as they got ready to show the Jesus film, <clears throat> that gang showed up. And they figured that since they had set up all of the equipment and they had passed out all of the invitations, they had every right to front row seats. And so they marched right down front, shoot everyone back just a little bit, and plunked down in front of that big screen. <clears throat> now, uh, I don't know if you all have seen the Jesus film before or not, but at the conclusion of the film, opportunity is given to pray the sinner's prayer of repentance and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When that invitation was given, the very first person to his feet was the leader of that gang. And all the rest of the gang members crowded around him. And they all came forward with a great group of people. And they knelt down there in the street. And you know it says over in Philippians that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise his name. And you see, it didn't matter what that violent gang of criminals had done in their life. Jesus was ready and willing to open his arms and to accept them and to give them a new opportunity in life. Praise his name. You see, we have seen an all-powerful God who is able to keep a pastor in the, in the face of threats upon his life, keep him faithful and obedient, to go out and do what God had called him to do and keep him safe and then to go even beyond that and change the hearts and lives of those individuals that had threatened his life. Praise the Lord. Now the third thing that we have, remember, that we have learned as we have served is that God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. And I'm sure if we had time this morning everyone could share some kind of an example or a testimony of how you have seen God's faithfulness in your life or in other people's lives. I had been in the city of Guayaquil, Ecuador all day long for a pastor's meeting. And after the meeting was over, I lived in Quito, Ecuador, up in the mountains. Guayaquil is on the coast about an eight-hour drive away or a half-hour flight. <clears throat> and so I was here on the coast and all of us decided to go out and get a bite to eat. So we went to this restaurant, and when we came out of the restaurant, <clears throat> I happened to remember that it was the night of the opening game of the NBA basketball season, and my two favorite teams were playing the opening game, the Boston Celtics and the Miami Heat. And I managed to find that on my cell phone. And so we came out of the restaurant, and I'm watching the game on my cell phone, and some of the pastors jumped in a pastor's car and they took off and the district superintendent's car was in a shop being repaired and, and there was one pastor, the district superintendent and my, myself that were still left. 
and so they hailed a taxi. Now I'm usually very careful about security issues, but I was with two Latin pastors that were both over six feet tall and, and big fellas, and I, I felt kind of safe. And besides, I was watching my favorite two teams play basketball. We jumped in this little foreign car taxi and we took off down the road and went about three quarters of a mile when another taxi passed us and cut us off. Two guys jumped out of the other taxi <clears throat> with weapons in their hands and they came and one forced his way into the front seat of our little taxi, shoving the district superintendent basically over into the area where the shifter was on that car. And then the other one came in the back door and shoved me away from uh, the door and into the middle of that taxi. And I didn't realize what was happening immediately. But let me take you back to December the 10th, 1995, when missionary Don Cox was kidnapped from our seminary campus in Quito, Ecuador. And the Church of the Nazarene was thrust into a crisis like we had never seen before. Don was the first Nazarene missionary to ever be kidnapped. The bad guys were asking for half a million dollars in ransom. The policy of the Church of the Nazarene is we do not pay ransom for missionaries. And pastor, we don't pay for pastors either, so if this happens to you, you're on your own. <clears throat> and, and it was such a difficult time. All of the Nazarene staff was uh, evacuated from the country except for four of us that stayed there to handle the negotiations with the bad guys. And it just looked so impossible like we would never see Don Cox alive again. But a miracle took place and Don was rescued and he was able to continue serving as a missionary in several other countries in Central America and today is, is retired and living in, in Florida. After that happened, I was sent to a special training a conference with Crisis Consulting International. They taught us how uh, <clears throat> not to be kidnapped. They taught us how if you were ever kidnapped, how you needed to respond. We were taught about a new phenomenon that was sweeping through Latin America called rapid kidnapping, where people would be grabbed, one to three people, and then within uh, from the time of the kidnapping for 24 hours, they would try to get everything of value from you. And they were usually very violent kidnappings in which many people were killed, many were left for dead, many very seriously injured. And I came out of that training session to put together a program, and I went through South America training the Nazarene missionaries on these issues. But I didn't realize what was happening to me in that little taxi immediately. But once again, I asked for forgiveness because I was watching my favorite two teams play basketball. But when I realized that I was in the middle of a rapid kidnapping, I put my phone on the floor of the car with face down, just trying to hide it. And uh, they, were, they had come in the car, the two bad guys, and they were hitting us. They were waving their weapons. They were uh, using foul, dirty language, and, and they were threatening us and, and asking for our valuables. <clears throat> and so I was seated here in the middle, and there was a large noise on the side. We were told to keep our eyes closed because they didn't want to be uh, recognized or identified later. And this big noise happened over here, and without thinking, I opened my eyes and looked at the big guy sitting there, and he said, What are you looking at? And he smashed me on his head with his pistol and split the, my forehead open and blood began to flow. And I'm a very quick learner, so I closed my eyes and I quit looking at him. <laughs> now, several of us had already begun to give him valuables like our rings and our watches. And, and uh, he said to me, you know, you haven't given us your wallet yet. Well, you know, I thought maybe they would forget me as they were getting all of these valuables, but I, since he was specifically answer, asking, I reached into my pocket and I pulled out my wallet, and I had uh, uh, three credit cards and my driver's license in one little slot, and uh, I kind of peeked up at him, and he didn't seem to be paying close attention, so I slipped all of those out, passed them to my left hand, and I had some cash in there, and so I flipped out that cash, and I handed him my wallet like that. He saw the cash, and he just grabbed it, and he never asked me about my credit cards. My thought was, at some point, this kidnapping will be over, and the bad guys will get out of the car, and if I hide my cards, 
Once the bad guys are gone, I can recover them and I won't lose them. So I took my, I was seated in the middle of the taxi and I took my cards in my left hand and I slid them in the crack of the car seat, which was between the part you sit on and the part you lean up against. I slid them in there to hide them temporarily, expecting to recover them later. <clears throat> well, about this time, the bad guy in the front seat got tired of the over six foot tall, 200 pound district superintendent sharing that little bucket seat with him. And so he made him crawl through the two bucket seats of the front into the back seat and he came back and he landed on top of the other pastor and on top of me. So you've got a little pile of pastors in the back seat of this little car and we're all quoting scriptures, uh, the, the verse of scripture that God has given to us as a promise and we're all praying silently. And so <clears throat> you have this little pile of scriptures and or, or pastors here and one of the bad guys says, what do you guys do for a living? We said, we're pastors. He said, oh, are you Catholic pastors or are you evangelical pastors? We said, we're evangelical pastors. Uh-huh, he says. That means you guys can't lie. <clears throat> so you kind of get the idea here. <clears throat> well, they finally had collected everything uh, from us that they thought was of value, except my cards that were hidden in the seat of the car. And... Uh, and so they, the, one of the cell phones rang at this point. And uh, the <clears throat> guy in the front seat who had uh, confiscated the, the, the valuables, he tries to turn it off. And without realizing it, he answered the phone and he set it back down there. Well, it turns out it was the district superintendent's wife calling to find out what had happened to us, why we hadn't arrived back at the church. And she heard the foul foul language, she heard the threats, she heard the demands, and she put two and two together quicker than the trained missionary, and she realized we were in problems. And so she began to call people in their local church, asking them to pray specifically about us. And she called her father, who was a Nazarene pastor in the same city, and they were in a prayer meeting that night, and so they began to pray specifically for us. And the three of us, as we look back on this afterwards, realized there was a point in time when the whole tone of that kidnapping came down, where they were no longer hitting us, they were no longer using dirty language, they were no longer threatening us. And it was because even though we did not know that anybody outside that car was aware of our situation, Nazarenes were already praying specifically for us and God was being faithful to answer those prayers and he was taking over that situation. Well, they had all of their the valuables and, and credit cards and they'd asked for the PIN numbers because their idea was to get the daily allowances from the credit cards. And so they stopped at the bus terminal where there was a whole bank of, of uh, ATM machines and the guy in the back seat, he... Uh, got out with the credit cards and the PIN numbers to go get those daily allowances. Once again, the taxi takes off up the street because they're keeping us in their possession while they verify the PIN numbers and get the allowances. And at this point, the taxi driver pulls out a weapon. And for the first time, we become aware that he is part of this whole scam. Well, the three of us in the back seat, since the bad guy got out, we untangle ourselves and once again, I'm seated over by the door, the district superintendent is in the middle and the other pastor on the far side. Well, it dawns on me, since the taxi driver is part of this deal, when the kidnapping is over, they'll just kick us out of the car, however that is, and they'll go down the way with the taxi because it belongs to them. If I'm going to rescue my credit cards and driver's license, I have to do that before this kidnapping is over. So we're supposed to have our eyes closed. We're not allowed to, to say anything to anybody. And, and we're just sitting there quietly. And so the district superintendent is now seated where I was when I hid the cards on the other side of him with my left hand. And I'm over by the door. So I can't say anything to him. And I don't know to this day what he thought. <laughs> but I reached my arm behind his back and stuck my fingers in the crack of the car seat and I felt one of the cards and I pulled it out between two fingers 
and I thought, I've got to hide it on my, on my person somewhere. And so I thought of my shoe, and I, I lifted up one of my, my loafers with the other foot, and I stuck it in my, under my heel and shoved my foot back in. I squinted up at the front, and the two bad guys seated up there didn't seem to notice what was going on. So I thought, I'll try it again. So I reached my arm behind the district superintendent, and, and this time I felt two cards. And I pulled them out. Now it's dark, it's late at night, and I can't see what they are. And I, so I try to get my, I, I figure I have to divide the, the spoils, so to speak. So I try to get my other shoe off, and it would not come to save my life. It would just stuck. And, and so I figure I can't keep going like this. I've got to hide the cards. And so I took them and I slid them in, in my right front pocket. Apparently the driver had been looking in the rear view mirror and saw me fidgeting around there, and he yells out to his other buddy, he says, Check out the gringo. He's hiding something from us. And so that guy turns around and he begins to pat me all over. And I'm thinking, if he finds those credit cards after, we, after we've been asked to give them everything of value, this could be all she wrote. This could be <clears throat> uh, uh, not only for me, but the other pastor and the district superintendent as well. And I think I forgot to mention what my verse was. And as I'm thinking what I'm going to do, my verse came back to my mind again. And it is Psalm 46, verse 10, which says, Be still and know that I am God. Boy, when I think of that verse, I think of the all-powerful God who made that statement and that he loves me and he's telling me to be still and I can trust that he's in charge of each and every situation in my life, I tell you, that brings me a lot of relief. The bad guy felt me all over and came up with nothing, and he turned around in the front seat again. I kind of squinted up at the front, saw they were looking forward, and I thought, I've still got one card in the seat of the car. But it's really too risky now. I can't risk my life or the others. I just got to forget about that card. I really hope it's not my driver's license. Because the last time I had renewed my driver's license, it took me over six months to get it done. And I didn't want to go through that again. I thought if it was a credit card, I can just call in and cancel the credit card. Well, the bad guy who got off at the ATM machines finally called and said, I've got all of the daily allowances. You can do whatever you're going to do with those guys. And so they drove us out to the edge of the city of Guayaquil. <clears throat> it was very dark, no street lights, and, and they stopped the car. And we're kind of squinting, kind of trying to see where we are. And one of the bad guys said, you know, we are only doing this because we really need the money. He said, you guys are pastors. Would you pray for us? <laughs> and I wanted to say to him, well, I've been praying for you for over two hours now. <laughs> but we had prayer with them, and they said, we're going to let you go. But all of you slide out on the right side of the car, car and just walk away and do not look back at the taxi or we'll shoot you dead. So three very obedient Nazarene pastors slid out of the back of that car, and we took off walking away and did not look back went around the corner, found somebody with a cell phone, called the district superintendent's wife. And she says, I knew you guys were in trouble. Well, we hung up with her, <clears throat> went down to the main road to try to find a taxi to take us back across town to the church. Well, it was a very dark area, and the taxi that had kidnapped us was a brightly yellow painted with all of the official numbers. It was an official taxi with a taxi sign, and coming down the street was the only car in sight, a car that was flashing its headlights. That means he was an illegal taxi. Well, there wasn't any other option, so we flagged him down. The district superintendent got in the front seat, and the other pastor and I in the back seat, and you could just feel the tension in the, that little taxi after what we had been through. We were kind of fixated on that taxi driver. And as we're driving along, <clears throat> I got to thinking... I wonder what would happen if he makes some kind of a false move. I could just imagine the Guayaquil papers, newspapers saying the next day, three Nazarene pastors arrested for ripping off head of taxi driver. <laughs> well, he didn't make any false moves, and he took us right to the Nazarene church, and there we found 
over 40 Nazarenes had gathered in, and for over two hours, they had been on their knees, lifting us up to that all-powerful God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And our God is faithful, and he brought us through that situation, and many more in our lives as we have served as missionaries. I would like to say this morning, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Praise his name. And I want to tell you, you also, if God calls you, you can be assured that he will give you promises, he will go with you, and he will help you. He is an all-powerful God, and more than anything, he is faithful, and he will be with you each and every step of the way. May the Lord richly bless you this morning. Thank you so much for allowing us to share with you. As I'm getting older, uh, I'm looking more and more like my father. That's because of all the genetics that's been passed down. And when I think of the values or moral code that our Heavenly Father established, which is also passed down to us through His Word, the Bible, it, it describes what we should look like as a believer, one of His kids. And I hope and pray that this series of messages will help us clearly see the values that God has established for us. And I ask that you please remain open-minded and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through some very challenging counter-cultural values that are recorded in the Bible that we must apply in our lives. Thanks for listening.